It's time to get your motor running. Put that pedal to the metal, burn some serious rubber, and get on a fast track to passive component land. Wait, what? I know, we're talking about automotive design, and maybe the first words to enter your mind were not, in fact, passive components. I get it, but maybe they should be. In the world of automotive design, and especially in today's infotainment-rich environments, the right passive components can make a huge difference. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Yes, I remember a day when the dashboard of my car was only a collection of assorted dials and knobs. Those days are long gone. But also are the days of not worrying about which inductor or capacitor you're going to use in your next automotive infotainment design. Today, Peter Blaze from Kemet and I are chatting all about infotainment power distribution, the importance of capacitors and inductors in this automotive arena, and where we're headed from here. We better get rolling. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about automotive infotainment solutions from Kemet. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me. Good morning, Amelia. How are you doing today? And it's great to be with you. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. Now, Peter, I love that we are talking about automotive infotainment today. I have been obsessed with automotive design for a long time, probably since my first car, which was a 77 Chevy Caprice Classic. So, Peter, what was your first car? Oh, my first car was a gem. It was a 1962 Ford Fairlane 500. So I drove that actually when I was in college and it was built like a tank and it drove through the snow in the Northeast like a tank as well. Nice. Now, Peter, with the Fairlane, we're talking about some pretty extensive features, right? Maybe a speedometer, a radio, perhaps? It was chock full of the latest technology of the day. It's funny because the radio was a vacuum tubed radio. I'll never forget it because I had to do some work on it one time and I took it apart and it had like four vacuum tubes and it might have had, I don't know, a dozen or so passive components. And a matter of fact, to tune it, you ended up having to go and rotate the knob and it was actually a variable capacitor. There was parallel plates that would kind of overlap each other and that's how it locked into the radio station. It had an AM band and I think it had an FM band as well. And of course on the cluster you had the speedometer and I think you had a couple of indicator lights like if you lost your battery voltage or uh, if you were overheating and stuff. Of course if you're overheating you had all the steam coming out from under the hood. So that was kind of the more telltale sign of a problem. For the day, it was technologically sophisticated, but frankly, compared to the present time, it was rather rudimentary. Sure. Now, Peter, you said you sold the Fairlane, right? You've moved up to something newer, right? I have. Over here, you can see I've got a modern day Ford Fairlane 500. It's the Lincoln MKZ. It's actually a hybrid vehicle and it has been upgraded a bit versus the 1962 version of the vehicle. So it's got a whole lot more to offer, whether it's creature comfort or infotainment. If we take a look at the inside of the vehicle, it has a plethora of gadgets. Any tech savvy person today gets into lots and lots of gadgets. And so, you know, that vehicle has a very sophisticated infotainment system, which ranges from some limited ADAS capability. So it keeps me in the lane if I'm kind of veering off. It can monitor the driver if you're dozing off and alert you. It kind of shakes and vibrates the wheel. There's no more needles on the dashboard. It's all just a LED display or LCD display, which you can actually go and program and have it do different things. You know, of course, it's communicating with the cloud. So if I happen to lose the car, I can go and find it or do mobile updates and a number of things. So it's got a whole lot more to it than just an AM and FM radio. So Peter, how does your work at Kemet overlap with your love of cars? I would imagine that it would overlap quite a bit. It overlaps a tremendous amount. And, you know, one of the interesting things is 
people, when they buy a car, they think the entire thing is made by the car company, you know, whether it's Ford or GM or Fiat Chrysler, Daimler, Volkswagen, whoever. And that's actually not the case. There's an entire ecosystem that goes into the vehicle and the subsystems and components that go into the vehicle. So all of the electronics are typically manufactured by other companies. We refer to them as tier ones typically that supply into the car companies. There's actually a consortium that's involved to ensure that the quality of the electronics are going to withstand the life and using conditions of the vehicle. The use conditions of vehicle are actually rather harsh. They're extremely harsh. So there's a consortium or an organization that kind of sets the standards for all of the components that go into vehicles, ensuring their longevity of performance and sufficient performance. And that's referred to as the AEC and is a technical committee, which comprises of the car companies and the tier ones, including companies like Kemet, which is a member of the technical committee for the Q200. And this governs whether it's the design, the qualification, everything associated with the passive components going into vehicles. And so if we take a look at Kemet's involvement, we've been involved with the automotive industry since uh, we started building capacitors back in 1958. And that's been expanded into our magnetics products with our acquisition of NEC token. Of course, now with our integration into Yagyo, part of the Yagyo group, they as well offer a number of products into the automotive industry. So if we take a look at our environment or ecosystem of components, you know, we cover pretty much all of the passive components that are going into the infotainment and safety related systems of the vehicle. So this is exciting times. At the heart of these systems is a semiconductor, but the semiconductors won't operate with the support of the passive components. So if we take a look at our offering and how we support the system from the Kemet's perspective, you know, we've got everything from polymer capacitors, whether it be tantalum polymers or aluminum polymers, and we've got the power inductors as well that are used in the systems. And then on the Yagyo group side, of course, they've got resistors that are heavily used and they've got antennas and diplexes that are used in the RF portion and communications portion of the vehicle. And of course, current sensors. And then where we overlap and complement each other is in the space of ceramic capacitors, which would be the dominant capacitor technology used in vehicles, whether it's infotainment or other systems in the vehicle. And frankly, that's the dominant technology used in everything around us that's electronics, uh, including the servers that are handling the data going back and forth for this virtual meeting that we're having. That's right. Now, Peter, how do all of these pieces fit together? What does the infotainment big picture look like? If we want to break down the infotainment system, we can go and illustrate it uh, using some simplified block diagrams. And I think what I'll do is I'll start out with what we all know or historically have known as infotainment, going back to my 1962 Ford Fairlane 500. That would be the audio section. So of course, the infotainment, the base of it is going to be the car radio, whether it's AM, FM, you know, you get other systems. It could also be it connecting to your cell phone and playing your latest music that you have downloaded on your phone. That would be the audio section, which would be the tuner and of course the class D amplifier, which has a lot of passive components in there and critical requirements there are you want low noise because you want to have high fidelity in the audio experience in the car. But of course, there's a lot of other systems that are going on today in the infotainment system. If we take a look at the video portion, Today, vehicles have a large number of cameras incorporated into the vehicle, whether it is for collision avoidance or backing up so you don't hit something or lane departure. Also, as you're driving down the highway, you've got cameras looking at the lane on the right and on the left, making sure that there's not a vehicle that you might accidentally 
veer into as you're changing lanes. There's a lot of different cameras in the vehicle. So you've got a video portion of the infotainment system, which is taking all of this input and analyzing it, turning it into digital building blocks that can then be processed and making sure that everything is operating in a safe mode. You know, you've also got radar systems that could sort of think of it as a derivative of video, which are also sensing how far your vehicle is from other things. So that would be another functional block of the infotainment system. And of course, you've got the display portion. Back in my fair lane, you know, the display was the cluster of the dashboard, and it consisted of a speedometer, which was a needle that would kind of rotate up and down and might have had a RPM indicator, which is another needle and a couple of little warning lights that would pop up if there was a problem occurring. Today, the displays are far more sophisticated. The analogous to it would be the display on your computer screen. Uh, right now, I'm using a notebook computer, and so the dashboard or cluster of the vehicle is very similar to the display on your computer screen. And depending on the vehicle, it can be programmed to display different things, whether it's different sets of information or you know, in my case, you know, if I want to be green and make sure I've got lots of flowers and leaves growing on my virtual tree on the right side of my display. There's a lot of functionality going on with the display, whether it's in the dashboard or the center console, which would be, you know, where your radio functions and tuning and climate control and all that other stuff. Of course, you also would have on some vehicles entertainment systems in the rear seats, you know, with the displays. And so you've got that functionality in the infotainment system. And then at the heart of all of this would be the controller. There's a lot of processing that's going on, whether it's figuring out what to put on the displays, whether it's taking the data from the cameras and the radar and manipulating it to go and figure out whether you're driving in a safe mode or to take corrective action. So there's a lot of processing, again, similar to the processing that would be going on in the computer that I'm using right now as we speak. And then some vehicles actually have a heads-up display, which is a really cool feature. It actually projects information onto your windshield. If we look at the infotainment system, everything I just described has, again, a lot of semiconductors that are performing all of these functions, and they're supported by a plethora of passive components, whether it be the capacitor technologies or the magnetics technologies that I mentioned earlier from Kemet, as well as the resistor technologies from the Yagyar group. So that is encompassed in everything. If we take a look at the communications aspect, besides all of those what I consider regular passive components, magnetics, resistors, and capacitors, we also have a lot of the communications or RF passive components, whether it be antennas or diplexers, which are differentiating between different high-frequency signals. Those would be incorporated into the communications portion of the infotainment system. Okay, so Peter, how does power get delivered to all of these different components? Can you explain that a bit? Absolutely, Amelia. When we take a look at a vehicle, most of us know the power system in the vehicle as the car battery, you know, which is a quote 12 volt battery, which is going to charge at roughly, you know, say 14 and a half volts, give or take. So that's the starting point for power inside of a vehicle. Your electronics that are in the infotainment system, the semiconductors, they don't operate at 12 volts. They operate at a much lower voltage. So therefore, what we have to do or what the designers do for the systems, they have to design what we refer to as a power distribution network or a power distribution system to take that 12 volts and convert it down into the usable voltages of the semiconductors. The way this is done is uh, using a large number of DC to DC converters, which will take one voltage and then basically chop it up at a very high rate of speed and then convert it to another voltage. And so if we take a look at a very simplified schematic of a DC to DC converter, you know, over here we see the voltage coming in and that would be the 12 volts 
give or take from the battery. And then the next step is, is we want to go and decouple this converter from the 12 volt car system. And the reason is, is that when the switcher inside of the DC to DC converter is turning on and off and on and off and on and off over and over and over again at a very, very high rate of speed, what it's doing is it's sucking in electrons and then it stops sucking in electrons and then it sucks more in and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this creates waves of disturbance that would go back into the car system that can disrupt other electronics in the vehicle, which would not be a good thing. So what we do is we place a capacitor at the very beginning or front end of the DC to DC converter to act as a reservoir of electrons. So it gives them up and takes them back and so on and so forth. So it decouples the system. And typically this part would be ceramics or polymer technology. And it's important that this component be able to withstand what we refer to as loaded dump. Then you're gonna go through the switcher on the output of the switcher, you want to go and have a nice, clean, stable voltage so that it's very friendly to the portion of the semiconductor that you're powering. And to do that, you create a filtering network, and that's going to comprise of two main components. That's going to be your inductor. It creates inertia for the electrons that are flowing. So it wants to keep them going at the same rate so that your current doesn't change significantly over a short amount of time. It just keeps on going. And then, of course, there's going to be a bulk filtering capacitor that is keeping that voltage very stable. So you're keeping a nice current and you're keeping a nice stable voltage on the output feeding the load. So that is, I guess, the basic building block of your DC to DC converter. And then within the infotainment system, you're going to have a whole bunch of these supplying all of the various voltages to all of the semiconductors that are performing all of the neat things that the infotainment system is doing. And typically the voltage is going to range from, you know, a little above the junction voltage of a transistor, so say about 0.8 volts and all the way up to about 5 volts. Now, when we take a look at all of these converters, they also need passive components going around them to support their operation. So we've already talked about the input and output filtering caps, but there's going to be more of those added outside of the functional block of the DC to DC converter. Typically, they're going to be aluminum electrolytic, ceramic, or polymer technology, aluminum polymer, tantalum polymer, those technologies on the input and output side. We also need to monitor the voltage. So, you know, these DC to DC converters are closed loop system. And so for a closed loop system to operate, you need to have information related to the output, which in this case is going to be the voltage. And you need to feed that back into the functional block so that in the control loop, it can make adjustments to compensate if the output is varying beyond a set limit typically using the voltage divider, using some precision resistors. We take the output voltage, run it through two resistors, and we tap off of the middle node and then feed that back into the DC to DC converter. So now we have a feedback loop of multiple or, or division of the output voltage. And this allows the DC to DC converter to adjust the pulse width of the modulation. So it's going to reduce it if it needs to lower the voltage, and it's going to make it slightly bigger to increase the voltage so that it can go ahead and maintain the proper voltage on the output. Also, you want to have some safety incorporated into the system. And so you want to monitor the current. So for example, if there's a subsystem in the infotainment system that develops a fault, you don't want it to draw a massive amount of current and take down the electrical system in the car. You want to be able to kind of shut it off remotely, or at least that subsystem, and let the rest of the unit continue to operate. To do this, we're going to use a current sense resistor, which is a very, very, very low resistance value, high current resistor, but it allows us to see what the minute voltage drop is across it. And then from there, we can calculate the current. And if the current exceeds a certain limit, then we can shut off that DC to DC converter and thereby keep the remainder of the system functional. 
So there's a whole lot going on within this power distribution network to convert from the 12 volts that is in the battery and being supplied to the electronics in the vehicle versus getting the electrons to the semiconductors that are actually doing all of the neat stuff that are in the infotainment system today. What if I'm not sure what kind of capacitor to use here? What should I really be thinking about? It would be wonderful if capacitors were ideal. You know, when you go to college and you learn electronics, you know, they draw capacitors, just two lines with wires connected to them. It's a, quote, ideal capacitor. And in reality, there's no ideal capacitor. They all have negative attributes. So what we've done is we've tried to put together a cheat table comparing the pros and cons of each of the technologies. Again, there's no perfect technology, so we need to take a look at the capability of the component versus the needs of the portion of the infotainment system that's at bay. I mentioned at the beginning that the most dominant technology of capacitor used in the infotainment system and the vehicle is the ceramic technology. And there's really two categories of ceramics. You get class one and class two. Class one would be your C's or G's. Very, very stable, very close to being an ideal capacitor, near, near ideal. The downside is, is that the dielectric constant is very low. It's like in the range of 30. So you don't get a lot of capacitance out of those devices. But they're very stable. They don't change with voltage. They don't change with time, extremely long life, and they're also, some of the parts are capable of extremely high temperatures. The class twos, which would be barium titanate-based technology, those have a much higher dielectric constant, but they have more negative attributes. Uh, One of them is DC bias. You put voltage on the part and it loses capacitance. It's just a characteristic of the barium titanate and the dipoles and domains within the barium titanate structure. There's also this oddball characteristic called aging. It doesn't mean it's getting old. It just means that it's losing capacitance over time because the crystalline structure of the barium titanate is changing from a cubic to a tectagonal structure in a dielectric constant. So that would be your film technology. Aluminum electrolytics are heavily used in both the input and output sides because they have big capacitance values. So they're typically used when you need much more capacitance value than the ceramics. The downside of aluminum electrolytics really boil down to two things. One is they tend to have a rather high ESR compared to the previous technologies I mentioned. And ESR is like the internal resistance in the part preventing the ability of electrons to go into the capacitor and out of the capacitor. And this really ties to the fact that there's an electrolyte that's used in the capacitor. And this electrolyte has ions in it that are in the solution. And they have to migrate one way or the other, depending on if it's being charged up or discharged. And because of the higher ESR, it's got this other characteristic we refer to as cap roll-off versus frequency. So as you go up in frequency, the amount of capacitance you have actually diminishes. We call this cap roll-off, and it can occur at a fairly low frequency, 30 kilohertz, 40, 50 kilohertz, depending on where the ESR is. And that's all incorporated either in data sheets or design tools that, that we have at Kemet and the industry has as well. And then also they have a life. I mentioned that they have electrolyte, which is a wet material, and this material is going to dry out over time during the operational life of the part. It's a part of the physics behind the way the part operates, and we can go on and on about the mechanics behind it, but it does occur. And the life is very much dependent on temperature, and we use a simplified equation where every 10 degrees drop in temperature from the rated temperature of the part, you double the life. So if it's a 2,000 hour part at 125 degrees C, if you go to 115 degrees C, it's going to last 4,000 hours. So that's aluminum electrolytic. And those are heavily, heavily used in vehicles where you need much larger capacitance value than ceramics. Then you've got kind of a newer entrant into the market, and that's polymer technology. And there's really two polymer technologies. You've got aluminum polymer, which are surface-mountable V-chips. And then you've got 
tantalum polymer, and there's a lot of similarities between the two technology with the polymer system used as the cathode. The anode is different between the two. One is aluminum and the other one is tantalum. The tantalum has the advantage of giving you a greater CV density than the aluminum polymer. The aluminum polymer does offer some larger capacitance values than you can get with the tantalum polymer simply because the parts are physically bigger. And you can also go higher in voltage in the aluminum polymer. We've got some that go actually all the way up to uh, 250 volts, not in surface mount, but in radial. Now, the polymer technology, uh, the advantage there is twofold again. The ESR is much, much, much lower because it's a solid system versus a wet electrolyte system. So you don't have the ion transfer or ionic transfer going on within a liquid. It's a solid state system. So the ESR is much, much lower, and it can be in the same range as what you see for class two ceramics. And you get more capacitance than you would with the class two ceramics. So that's one advantage. And because the ESR is lower, the cap roll-off, which occurs in all electrolytics, will occur at a higher frequency. So instead of rolling off at 30 kilohertz or 50 kilohertz, you're now capable of going well up close to a megahertz before you start to see roll-off occurring for some part numbers. So that's the key benefit. And then the life is going to be much longer than what you see in a wet system. And the reason is because you don't have a dry out mechanism. It's a solid dry system. So in the aluminum polymer, we use a simplified equation for every 20 degrees C drop in temperature from the rated temperature, you're going to see a 10x increase in life. So if you're 2000 hours at 125 degrees C, you go to 105 degrees C, now you've got a 20,000 hour operational life before your cap or ESR goes out of the limit for life calculation. And in the case of tantalum polymers, it's a little bit more nebulous, uh, but generally if you're 85 degrees C or lower and you're nine tenths of rate of voltage or lower, you're going to see a usable life 10 years or longer. And again, it depends on the actual condition that the uh, parts used and in the part number. As a you know, little factoid, the technology is heavily used in data centers that are actually handling the data for this uh, virtual meeting. And those data centers are running continuously on like a vehicle 24-7, 365. And they're operating close to, in some cases, 90, 95 degrees Celsius. So polymer technology, very robust for the vehicle for bulk cap. The legacy technology is MNO2 for bulk cap. This is also a solid system. It's used in manganese dioxide as the cathode, which is a semiconductor, which is inherently more resistive than the other cathode system. So it's got, a, again, a cap roll-off at a lower frequency. Very stable, but does have higher ESR. And you have to derate these for reliability. You've got to derate them 50%, and then there's some additional derating because of uh, temperature if you go above 85 degrees C. This technology, it's used less and less in the vehicle platforms and infotainment. It's really because things have moved on to a much higher frequency today. I think so. So, Peter, what about inductors? How do they really compare here? Well, inductors for vehicles and infotainment really fall into two different categories. We've got metal composite, and then you've got ferrite. And then within ferrite, you've got two main materials, and then within those main materials, you've got a whole bunch of different variations. So let's talk a little bit about each one of those. Metal composite, we're seeing that as the dominant inductor technology for vehicles, including infotainment. There's a number of reasons behind this. So a metal composite, to explain the technology a little bit, what we do is we take metal particles, which are an alloy, and they are surrounded by basically a resin, uh, which is an insulating material, and they're compacted or molded around a wire, which is creating your inductor. The inherent nature of this is you've got a distributed air gap throughout the entire structure because you have all of these little tiny metal particles that are separated by this resin. 
one particle isn't able to make an electrical connection to the next one. There's a slight gap, an insulating gap from one particle to the next and the next and the next. So you have a distributed air gap, which creates some unique attributes for the device. Uh, the first one is, is that it's inherently shielded. Your magnetic flux isn't streaming out all over the place, which is a problem or can be a problem with ferrite. There's shielded and unshielded ones, but th there's always flux that's escaping, which can create issues. So your medical closet are inherently shielded. And then the second thing is, is that inductors have this thing called saturation. And what will happen is, is that the material saturates and so it's no longer able to go and amplify the magnetic field as your current increases and so therefore what happens is is you'll see your inductance set at a certain level and you hit a certain current and then your inductance will plummet and at that point the inductor is not going to be usable in the circuit i mean it's still going to operate but it's not going to provide the inductive performance at the circuit is requiring from it. So saturation is a big issue. And saturation of materials tends to be temperature dependent. The higher the temperature, the lower the current that it saturates. Metal composite, because of the way it's structured with the distributed air gap and the alloys that are used, we talk about a soft saturation. So instead of the inductance doing this and then plummeting off a cliff at a certain current at a temperature, what will happen is it will slowly, very slowly and gradually drop off as you go up in current and also up in temperature. This makes it very ideal to design your power distribution scheme around because no matter if the car is operating at minus 40 degrees C or if you're in the middle of uh, Death Valley in the summertime and it's 130 degrees F, you're still going to have nearly the same amount of inductance for the circuit to operate on, which is very important. And also because of uh, the fact that it's got the soft saturation, we can design these parts to operate at higher temperatures, whether it's uh, 150 degrees C or even higher temperatures, much higher than what typical ferrites are able to operate. If we look at inductor use today in vehicles, for power applications, right now the dominant technology in I expect this to continue in the future, is going to be metal composite technology. The downside is they do have lower inductance values than you would typically see in ferrite, and that's because of the distributed air gap. And then your efficiency is not going to be as high as certainly manganese zinc ferrite, and that's due to core losses. You get losses from the wire, conductive losses, and then you've got core losses, which is from the currents that are set up in the material. So that's metal composite. If we take a look at ferrite, we've got uh, manganese zinc and nickel zinc. The more dominant one that's used today tends to be manganese zinc, and the reason is uh, twofold. Number one is you get a higher inductance out of the material, and then the second reason is your efficiency is really the highest of everything that's out there. So you've got the lowest core loss in the material for manganese zinc. Nickel zinc is, is very good for core loss, but it's not as good and you don't get as much inductance out of the nickel zinc. Both of these have hard saturation. So what happens is, is that you go up in current, and this is again affected by temperature, and then it, the inductance will fall off a cliff. So you need to design the system to have peak currents that are below that saturation current at the maximum temperature that the system will be operating. Also, the Curie temperature of the manganese zinc is not quite as high as the nickel zinc, so therefore your falling off the cliff will occur at a lower temperature than the nickel zinc. And then the last thing is insulation resistance, which uh, most people don't really consider or worry about, but that's really the resistance between the conductor that's carrying the electrons and the core material itself. Metal composite has got good insulation resistance, and this is really a function of the resin that's used to bind the particles together in the molding process. And then the ferrites can range from very good to not as good, and that's really a function of, I guess, the oxide layer that's forming on the surface. So that is the overview of the two main magnetic technologies that are used, metal composite and ferrite. And by and large, metal composite, at least for power electronics going into the infotainment system and most of the systems in the car are going to use metal composite. So Peter, 
What does your collaboration with Yagyo bring to this auto infotainment party? The collaboration really allows Kemet and the Yagyo group, now that Kemet's joined the Yagyo group, to offer a much broader portfolio of passive components to the automotive industry, you know, really leading to uh, technically an infinite number of solutions for the customer. Yagyo has a broad automotive line, whether it's already in their capacitors, but also in their RF products and their resistors that they're supporting. Kemet has the magnetics and the capacitor portion, and but we've also got a very, very, very long history in the automotive industry and, and the expertise required for component design and qualification and you know, really the way the whole automotive industry operates. And, you know, that dates back to our first capacitor production back in 1958. By bringing these two cultures together, this really is going to offer a much broader range of passive components at a very high quality level to our automotive customers. Fantastic. Well, Peter, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Amelia, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute delight and pleasure. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about automotive infotainment solutions from Kemet. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.